Hi everyone and welcome. Um, we're just going to give people a couple of more minutes to join us and get settled in. Um, <clears throat> if you can keep yourself on mute, uh, it'll just help with the, the background noise. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third in our series um, with ASI. Today, we're going to be talking about general liability for social workers. Very important. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. When you signed up for this webinar, you agreed to a code of conduct. Uh, we expect you to be respectful to the presenters and each other, which I know you will be because you're professionals. Um, let's see, you are being recorded and we are live on Facebook. Any questions that you have for the presenters, please put them in the chat or raise your yellow hand. Um, they will take questions at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our wonderful friends from ASI. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lonnie Rapp, and I work with the NASW Risk Retention Group, which is um, focused on offering our liability insurance uh, to social workers. Um, I am Lonnie Rapp, the Vice President of Underwriting and Distribution, um, and I um, am excited today uh, to be a resource panelist and um, also want to um, introduce Dina Larson, of which um, I'd love for her to um, share her amazing credentials and popularity. Good, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dina Larson. I'm a senior risk analyst with GB Healthcare. Uh, if my voice sounds familiar, it may be because you have talked to me on the NASW Risk Retention Group uh, Risk Management Hotline. Um, and my, the company you may have heard of is Western Litigation. We recently did a rebranding. Um, I talk to social workers. That's, that's my job. I talk to social workers all day long about different risk management topics. And so I too am very thrilled to be able to uh, be with you today and discuss general liability risks. And with that, I would like to introduce our third partner in crime, Phil Lawson. Phil? Hi. Hi, everybody. This is Phil Lawson. I'm Vice President of um, Claims and Product Development here at uh, the NASW Risk Retention Group, uh, commonly called RRG. We use a lot of acronyms. Um, I wanted to let you know, Dina is, uh, she works for Gallagher Bassett, which is a, a vendor we have. It's a, a prize partner we've had since 2012. And uh, they, they bought Western Litigation. And what they do for us is they adjudicate our claims for us. And they, they have a network of lawyers, uh, about 300 of them around the country who specialize in allied health and behavioral health uh, legal defense. And uh, so we work with them on um, claims uh, to protect our uh, policyholders. That's how that organization relates with us. So what we wanna do is I'll talk a little bit about general liability and then we'll, we'll pass the topic around to, to everybody. Uh, but I, I wanna share a few things with you that, that you really need to know up front. Um, <clears throat> along with professional liability, general liability is typically considered a first line of protection of coverage for practitioners who purchase coverage for 
um, what's also called commercial liability. Uh, it's not a property cover. It's it's a liability cover, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, it has about uh, general liability itself in the United States has about eighty billion dollars in uh, annual premium sales, and um, mo most insurance carriers um, have a deductible or charge an extra premium for a zero deductible for general liability. We we don't do that. You have uh, first dollar coverage, so there's there's no deductible at all uh, on you. Uh, now I want to I want to um, make it clear that some people think that if you have general liability, if you have a water leak or something in your office, you're covered. That, that's a different thing, that's, that's a property cover. So if you're looking for uh, a property insurance policy, you need a commercial liability policy or property and contents. Think of your homeowner's policy that may cover uh, you know, hazards and perils to your home or apartment, that kind of thing, or contents. The, what the general liability covers is your liability for other people's assets, uh, specifically those people who come to see you, your, uh, your clients, where you provide therapy, and they might get injured in your office, uh, a slip and fall, something might fall on them and, and hurt them. Uh, so general liability would cover that liability. Um, if they have something stolen in your office, it's their property, and you're liable for that. We cover that as well. But if you have your own wallet sitting on a desk and somebody steals it, general liability doesn't cover that because that's a property uh, issue. Okay, so I, I just want to make that distinction. Uh, typically, now general liability um, would would be compulsory uh, as required by landlords, <clears throat> and uh, they want to be named as an additional insured. So, so you know what I'm saying is if you have um, if you have your own office, uh, you, you should get a general liability policy. If you're an employee um, of a social work practice and you do not provide covered or you do not provide services outside of that office, then you probably don't need to buy it. Um, but if you're providing services um, outside of the office, you know whether or not um, you're you know you're employed by another party it'd be a good idea to get the general liability because we, we cover that um, in, an, in office pearls and um, uh, you know, out of office venues. Um, the, um, the most common uh, claims that we see in general liability are um, uh, burglary and theft losses, uh, slip and falls, um, and um, thefts. You know, just basic thefts, not only burglary in, in the office, but a theft in a venue. For example, if you're holding a, um, a, uh, a session with multiple clients in a hotel ballroom, for example, and somebody has a pocketbook or a wallet stolen, well, our policy, not all general liability policies will cover you for that, but we will. We'll cover for that property loss because you're liable for that, uh, that loss from your, you know, your client. Uh, just to give you a feel for some of the uh, the costs of these these claims, you'll see that um, uh, well, with respect to customer and client injuries, slip and fall is very common. That's about thirty thousand um, dollars in indemnity expense, uh, legal expense. So you know, if you don't have coverage, who's going to pay the claim? You know, you don't have an insurance company to shift that risk to, so you do. A uh, typical theft claim is about eight thousand dollars, and a slip and fall is about twenty thousand. I mentioned client injury; it could be an object falling on somebody. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, general liability has um, really several components. I'll, I'll, I'll name the the most uh, uh, important components that pearls that we we cover, and it's uh, property damage, but but not the insured's property; it's only the client's property, when you're providing professional services, a uh, bodily injury to the client, personal injury to the client, <clears throat> which could be a theft of their property while you're providing professional services, advertising injury, which you don't see very often, and fire legal liability. Well, what does that mean? Uh, that means if something happened in your office where you caused a fire uh, to somebody else's property was damaged because of that fire, then we cover that. But we won't, you don't, the general liability 
liability doesn't cover the contents and chattels in your office that uh, burned up because you started you had a fire. It's the third party, the um, the you know the landlord's property or the client's property. Um, now, just so you know that in the industry, there's there's many professional liability carriers out there, but they uh, very few of them. In fact, I don't know of any except us that will sell a standalone general liability policy. What I've seen is the, the, the carriers provide a professional liability policy, and then they, they say they have general liability and they make it an endorsement, <clears throat> but it's not as comprehensive as, as what you really need. And a lot of them have very low limits uh, for losses, <clears throat> especially fire. Um, and our, our limits go up to, the, uh, to a million uh, per occurrence and three million in aggregate. You don't see that in other uh, competitor policies. Uh, I'm not telling you that as an advertising. I'm just saying that that's, um, you know, that's just a fact. Um, do you want to add anything, Dina or, or Lonnie, to what I've said? Um, yeah, you know, one thing that I have that I have seen come up um, a, a bit more recently, uh, it's a therapy modality, I guess, if you will, that some therapists have been asking about, especially on the hotline, and that is walk and talk therapy. Um, the client may want to be outside. It may be one of those things that it's uh, that the client needs to keep moving. Um, it, they may be more comfortable sharing. While you're out on a walk, you're gonna walk through a park. Um, the, the therapy piece, is is separate from this obviously but phil if i'm hearing you right please correct me if i'm wrong but if you are doing walk and talk therapy you're out walking in the park your client spins their ankle sprains their ankle and that kind of thing if you've got the general liability coverage is would that cover yes something like that? yeah well in that case excellent example dina thanks for bringing that up because what what our gl does is the way we designed it is is that um the office becomes um more of an intangible it, it the venue moves with the therapy so for example if you're um we insure uh, people who provide fitness um counseling and whatnot and if they happen to use a pool a swimming pool somewhere um for either exercise or for emotional or behavioral help while they're providing therapy and there's an accident you're gonna have a lot of slip and falls there we we, we cover that because the office has been moved to that remote location so so really, the GL in this case, our GL anyway, it 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 covers the um, the person as opposed to the venue. The venue moves with the, the professional services, but professional services have to be be provided during the time of the injury. That's that's what I was going to say, and that that relates to most everything, whether it's the professional liability or the general liability. You need to be providing those those client or patient services when whatever happens, happens. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, if, if they, they slip and fall on their way into or out of your office or something falls on or they bring a child with them, the kid's running around and, you know, slams his head into the desk, which yes, I have seen happen or I've seen that claim come across. Um, as long as you're providing those professional services, that's the trigger that we need yeah. to see. Yeah, we had a, uh, here's an example. Thanks for bringing that up again. We had a, a real live claim that came in and we paid it. <clears throat> we defended the uh, social worker. The social worker had a dog, but it wasn't using the dog in therapy. <clears throat> he just didn't get the dog dropped off at the, the doggy daycare that day. He was late. So he came to the office with the dog, his pet dog, and was sitting, minding his own business in the office. And uh, a little boy was in there, six years old. He was a the son of a client and um, I was just sitting in the office and uh, uh, a FedEx driver came in and dropped off a package when he opened the door, it startled the dog and the dog bit the, the boy in the face. So we had an $11,000 uh, physical injury claim and, and we defended the social worker and paid it and adjudicated it. So that, that's an example that it was, the, 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 the child was not uh, undergoing professional services uh, but our policy extended to that in the office and and covered it. 
I have nothing further to add. Um, I, I don't see any questions. Does anybody have a, a question since we're at a midpoint as well? Okay. I would say that, um, you know, the, our, our GL is um, for members, I believe it's, um, what is it, $154, Lonnie, a year? Is that the premium? I think that's what it is. And for non-members, it might be north of $300 a, a year. But I mean, you're looking at for 1 million, 3 million in coverage. Um, you're, I mean, you're looking at, at a really high value, comprehensive um, product to protect you. Um, if you're giving, um, if you have your own office, even, even your home office, because your home owner's policy may not cover you, when you're providing professional services in a home office, and if you're working for an employer, they're they're going to cover you in in their office. But if you're providing services out, even moonlight, if you're providing providing services outside of the office, I advise you to buy a general liability policy because some of these claims will, are really really high. Like I said, thirty thousand dollars for a a customer injury or just a slip and fall, minor slip and fall where you you bruise yourself up or twist your ankle or something. It's that the average claim there is, um, uh, $20,000, $20, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just, um, uh, something drops, uh, you know, a vase falls off a shelf and hits somebody in the head. That's a $10,000 average claim. <laughs> so compared to the, the premium, it's, uh, you know, it's well worth it. $154 to, to shift the risk to us. Yeah, just to chime in behind Phil, um, if any of you have been to the emergency room recently um, and just just to go in because you had a sprained ankle, sprained wrist, sprained something, anything, an emergency room visit, just a basic visit can be 15, 20 grand. Um, it's not uncommon. And so whatever whatever your patient, your client is going to be charged, that's going to come back to you. Um, the GL policy can help offset that. Yeah, you know, a um, just something innocent. There's two things I, I want to share. Um, <clears throat> burglary and theft losses are the most frequent of general liability claims, and their average uh, is about $8,000. So it's, it's not really severe, but it is if you're paying it out of your own pocket. And uh, so you're, you're likely to en encounter that. Uh, especially when you're when you're um, doing offsite therapy, where pocketbooks and wallets are exposed, and um, uh, people who walk by a conference room where you have 20 clients and you're running some sort of a educational session or something like that, somebody grabs a pocketbook and runs. Uh, so you know that that that's one example. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other was uh, something very innocent, like a hot beverage. You know, uh, somebody comes to your office. And, and you have a, you know, you're hospitable, you have a machine there, a microwave or whatever that makes coffee or a hot tea and somebody, somebody spills something. Uh, that, that's a pretty common claim too, you know, and uh, there's damages from that. Hot mm -hmm. liquid burns in your office or, or your, your walk and talk therapy. Chances are somebody's, when they're doing walk and talk, especially in cold weather, they have a hot tea on them or something and it spills, there's a liability. We cover that. Um, I, hey, Phil, um, there is a question in the chat. Um, and it, it says, what level of coverage is recommended for a school social worker that does not necessarily do clinical work in that setting? So um, just to clarify, um, are, are you speaking you in terms of, of faculty? If, if you're a faculty yeah. member, um, I, yeah. I don't think you need it. I mean, yeah. if I was a faculty member, I had been, I was a moonlight instructor, but I, <laughs> uh, I never for 19 years for university, but I, I never bought GL because I always did my teaching in, in the classrooms provided and I was a part-time employee. So uh, I, if you're in a school faculty, I don't, I don't see a reason that you need it. Now, if you're providing moonlight services with your own clientele, that's a different situation. I get it. Yeah, I agree with Phil on that. If you are providing all of your services at the school, everything happens at the school, the school should have coverage for that. And yeah. 
that's a conversation that you want to have with your administration that that uh, if something happens, you know, um, kid comes to my office and falls, what happens? Do I tell you? Do I what? Who do I tell? That's I think that's that's a good conversation to have. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. But I wanna I wanna leave you with a final point, at least from my monologue, is is that general liability is different than a property cover. A lot of people think if they have a frozen pipe and it leaks that uh, you know everything's covered. Well, uh, if if you cause the problem, you're liable for it. And if if a third party, meaning someone else uh, outside of your sphere, your control, like a you know landlord or somebody, sustains some lie some injury you're, you're you're liable for that but um it's not going to replace you have a fire or a flood and you have your couch and your office furniture is ruined well that's a property issue that's not a general liability that's why it's called general liability um you know what you what you're looking for is a property insurance cover to uh ensure your possessions feel for something like this that would it be and and the only comparison that I can come up with is what I used to get um, before I before I bought my first house was renter's insurance. Yeah. Um, something that that kind of covered you if the landlord had a problem. If yeah. you know, if the landlord caused an issue, the landlords, you know, you the pipes broke, but it wasn't something you did the landlord maybe didn't keep up on the plumbing or whatever. Yeah, that that would be that would be similar to uh, in the category of a homeowner's policy, whether it's a, a rent uh, rental situation or you own the own the home or where, where the dwelling is, the property is covered. Uh, but there's also a product on the market called BOP, uh, it's business owner's policy. And uh, that has certain general liability in it and, and property covers as well. We don't write that, we're not allowed to uh, because the risk retention groups are not allowed to write property insurance. Uh, but that's something to look at if you have a, a, you know, a real business and you need extensive coverage over a whole lot of different categories, including property that you have and in inventory and other kinds of things, chattels, personal property. That's a product to look at, to consider. But there again, BOP may not cover you when you're providing uh, walk and talk therapy in remote locations. You know, it probably doesn't. You know, it's, it's centered around the... Um, the domicile or the, you know, the office location. Yeah. I would say an, another plug for our product is our product extends to the insured across state lines. And we don't, we don't write the product based on uh, the number of offices. We insure people who have offices in multiple states, any size, any number of employees. Uh, we don't underwrite based on that. We just, for the larger businesses we, or practices, we only look at uh, what your annual revenue is and then go to the corresponding uh, rate based on that. If it's uh, one or two people, then we look at what the occupation is and we have a you know, standard rate. Um, so you know, a lot of uh, insurers who uh, want to take a look at what they do a census and they want to get an employee count, get everybody's name, and, and they're interested in square footage of all the offices and how many have. We don't, we don't deal with that at all. Ours is very simple, yet it's uh, very comprehensive. Bonnie, did I see more things pop up in the chat, or did I? Um, I didn't. I I think we only had the one question. Um, and actually, if you guys don't mind, I can just add a couple of things of of what I see. Um, you know, the ebb and flow of uh, liability insurance program. Um, just to a clarify. Um, I just sort of kind of want to segregate the options that we have. Um, first and for foremost, and I almost consider it primary, um, is a professional liability insurance policy. That is um, a policy that is actually different than optional general liability insurance. So just to re-clarify, if you're practicing offering professional services, that's where your professional liability policy is most instrumental. General liability is in addition to my professional services, I might have some liabilities associated um, with uh, the way that I'm 
operating and there may be um, liabilities associated with bodily injury of somebody coming and going. Um, I also find that a lot of times if you um, are a independent contractor for maybe a contract for let's say services, if you look through that contract, sometimes they'll say you need to have a professional liability insurance policy and general liability insurance. So that's why those two policies in that scenario would be necessary. And our um, policy does a great job in fulfilling um, what they're trying to achieve within that. So they are separate policy forms. Um, the last one um, liability type policy that we offer, it's the third one. Um, it's cyber liability. So like take, for example, a lot of folks, um, especially when all of their services went online, um, actually replaced their general liability insurance at the time, maybe for a short term, maybe things changed. Um, some of them replaced it with cyber liability, meaning the um, outcomes that we in that policy, cyber liability handles um, if your um, application that you're using to talk to clients is hacked. So that um, sort of closes that loop on, on that area. So just to remember, always keep your professional liability insurance intact no matter what. Circumstances may lend you to um, decide whether or not general liability is necessary or not. And of course, you wanna ask your own risk questions and we also um, have a service center where you can ask those questions further as well. Um, and then the last um, liability policy um, to consider um, subsequently, especially with a lot of online uh, use is that cyber liability policy. So just wanted to share that with you just to try and uh, keep every uh, program in, in its uh, swimming lane. Um, but of course, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, insurance is a choice. So, um, oh, and actually, Elizabeth, it's funny. Um, Elizabeth asked, um, what about a social worker using social media to reach people? Um, that's actually a question that would more relate to, um, would that be more professional liability, Dina and Phil? That's, yeah. that's a good question. Probably, yes. Um, you want to be careful when you're reaching out with social media um, for things that we've talked about on the last couple of weeks. Um, if, and I'll just use Facebook because that's the one that everybody knows. Uh, you may think that you're reaching out to people in a closed group, but that closed group, those people have friends and those friends have friends. And it quickly spirals out of control before you, before you know. Um, it's one thing to just kind of say, "Hey, I'm having uh, I'm having a group uh, counseling session or group coaching session on um, anxiety issues or something." And I'm just making this up as I go because I don't use make very good examples, um, but. It's one thing to just say, I'm going to do this. Everybody's welcome. But then it's also, it, it's totally different if you reach out to a group of people and start getting specific about, at our group last week, we talked about, now you're sharing information that's getting into some HIPAA issues, or it could be. Um, so you want to be careful with that. But if you're doing all of your therapy on, on telehealth, and you have no intention of going back to a brick and mortar office or anything, you may want to seriously consider that cyber policy. It may be more appropriate for the cyber coverage rather than general liability coverage. Yeah, you're both- yep. uh, To look at your practice and see what you think. Yeah, you're, you're both touching on a, a very important issue. I, I look at insurance as a, a cafeteria line. I love cafeteria's, you know, and, and uh, usually, the ones I used to go to as a kid, they had the desserts out first. So I always have two or three desserts. I never had room for my entree. But uh, insurance is like a cafeteria. And in there, you have a section for professional liability, and you have general liability, and you have cyber liability, and there's probably a few others, uh, depending if you're an employer or not. There's a string of others. Um, but when you, when you hit the PLI uh, part of the line, 
professional liability, you'll see that, uh, okay, well, let's see, if I have a, um, a, a breach of uh, records, of client records, am I covered or not? Uh, yes, you're covered. Under our policy, there's a lot of PLI policies out there that don't cover that uh, client data breach. Ours does. However, if you have a, a breach from a third party, a data provider or a network service or even a mover who's relocating your paper files, uh, the PLI policy doesn't cover that, no one's does. Uh, so that's why we created the um, cyber liability policy, uh, primarily because uh, the Congress enacted a law, uh, HIPAA high tech law it's called back in 2014, uh, which held a social worker liable for breaches to client records, not just one client, but everybody has to be notified if one, one client's records are breached. Um, so that's why we primarily why we introduced cyber. Now we get to the GL part of the cafeteria line, and that's that deals with okay. Well, PLI will cover you, um, you know, for certain aspects and damages arising from professional services in your office. Um, there's a lot of competitors who do not provide bodily injury uh, to, uh, for client um, injuries while you're providing professional services. We do that's standard, um, but there's other other things that are not provided in PLI, which we mentioned which would be third party liability for a slip and fall. Uh, although some of our PLI does cover that as well uh, for uh, uh, clients who, who, uh, who sustain some losses. Um, but uh, the GL provides a lot more comprehensive coverage in situations where you're providing um, services outside of your office or maybe even inside your office where there's occurrences or incidents that fall outside of the PLI. So it's really a cafeteria line. You have to look at your, your practice and determine um, where your risks are. You're doing an inventory of risks. And then the, the purpose of buying insurance is to shift that risk to the carrier. And so you have to assess every year you want to assess your, um, your practice to see if there's any changes and, um, and then modify your insurance per purchases accordingly. Uh, that's a really good point, Phil, too, that, that you need to assess your risks every year. Um, your practice is going to grow and change. Uh, we saw this, and I apologize if you can hear snoring in the background, it's my bulldog. He decided to come to work with me today, so my apologies. Um, you want to you wanna look at your, you want to look at, at your, your practice. Um, at, at the beginning of 2020, nobody had a clue that COVID was going to be as dramatic a, a, a change for everyone as it turned out to be. Um, in January of 2020, people were considering, gee, maybe I'll try and do telehealth. Maybe it'd be kind of nice to work from home one or two days a week. And then we get to March, 2020, and all of a sudden, bam, everybody's working from home. And you've got clients who are panicked and they are dealing with with the anxiety of COVID and now your, you, your phone's ringing off the hook and you got to figure out fast how to deal with these people. Um, all of a sudden, cyber liability and telehealth, that was, that was the big question. That was yeah. how we needed to look. Now things are settling back down again. There are, I have heard rumors, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard rumors that some carriers are going to stop covering telehealth. Okay, are you going to need to go back to a brick and mortar store? Um, are, are you going to need to maybe rethink the issue of general liability coverage? And so every year you just need to go back to ground zero and say, okay, what am I doing? Am I only seeing people in an office? Okay, got to have my professional liability. Stop at that, stop at that line in, in the cafeteria and load up there. You never want to be without professional liability coverage, I promise. You yeah, that's true. That. Um, but then look at the rest of your practice. Are you only going to do telehealth? Are you going to do some telehealth and some face-to-face? -face? Is it worth the extra, the extra premium that you might have to pay just in case something happens? I think it is, but, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of having coverage because I know how expensive some of these claims can get. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, what happens? You get a plaintiff's lawyer, and the the lawyer's like a fish, you know, fishermen. If they're they're throwing a casting a wide net, and they're going after any any defendant they can, um, 
whether or not they have insurance, it doesn't matter. They're, they're just, they're naming everybody. And uh, so, you know, if I was practicing, I would get, if I didn't have um, an employer who took on the responsibility for general liability, I would definitely get that because uh, I would probably practice in a remote location or do the walk and talk as well. And definitely PLI. Yeah, you have to have that. And cyber, if, if I'm doing any kind of teletherapy um, or using uh, any kind of uh, digital storage for my records, I would definitely get that. Helen, is there anything that we missed that you think we need to cover? Or any, any other questions that somebody has? We're happy to chat. Yeah, if you've got a question, please put it in the chat or raise your yellow hand. Um, this is a really great opportunity to ask those questions, you know, that you might be thinking of. So um, <clears throat> please raise your yellow hand or put it in the chat. Also, Elizabeth asked what moonlight services are, and I should imagine that's jobs you're taking outside of your regular job yeah right. yes yeah especially if you're it's it's not so much moonlighting maybe if you're if you have your own private practice but if you work for an agency and you moonlight and go um help out at, at a church or something i don't know um but that that's what would be that that would be considered a moonlighting yeah it's something outside of the normal work environment. Dina, uh, what's your favorite part of your job? Favorite part of my job is actually is actually doing this, talking to social workers. I, I got a, a question one time, I was speaking with a social worker, it's been a couple, three years ago now, I guess. And he asked me uh, where I went to school, where I got my degree in social work. And I chuckled and I said, I got my degree on the phone talking to you guys. I'm a paralegal by profession. Um, I've been a paralegal for 30 some odd years. And so I, I come at all of my discussions with social workers about the claims and the issues that they have from a litigation perspective. Um, Phil hit it right on the head. There, there are attorneys out there who will throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. They want to find as many insurance policies to hit as they can. And they don't care who gets caught up in the, in the waves, quite honestly. And so being able to bring that experience, um, I spent 18 years in a law firm before I came to, to my job now. And that gave me, as I will freely admit, a lot of cynicism. Um, I'm pretty cynical because I see things, I tend to see things half empty. Um, when it comes to this stuff, because I've seen how, how people get affected. Um, I, I've seen the board complaints. I've seen people submitting things, as Phil said, where the, the, the dog bit the little kid in the face. And um, I've talked to a lot of social workers who are just thinking about expanding their practice. This is what I want to do now. What do you think? Um, those are the questions that you need to be asking yourself up front. Um, I did have a rather long conversation with a social worker who was considering adding walk and talk therapy to her practice. And we talked about all the different things she should consider and what a consent should look like. Your standard consent is not going to cover walk and talk therapy because there's so many other things to consider, not just the physical health of your client, are they able to walk? Uh, you know, uh, are they able to do a half a mile walk or however long the path is? Um, what do you do when you see other people? Maybe you live in a small community and everybody knows you're a therapist and they see you walking with somebody, they assume that person is a client. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. How are you gonna handle that? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself you know, and again, with the walk and talk, where are you going to walk? What does the path look like? Is it smooth? Is it, you know, are you, you guys are in New Jersey. I've heard tell you guys have winter. 
and some pretty substantial weather, you know, in the winter time. So you need to be thinking about all of those things. Think about this from your client's perspective. What do I need to do to keep my client safe? What, the, what questions do I need my client to answer before I start this kind of therapy? So do that for your whole practice. You know, just think about how you want your practice to look. Are you going to expand it? Are you going to minimize it? Are you going to take a leave? Um, talk to a therapist um, a month-ish or so, maybe two months ago now who wanted to take a sabbatical. She was um, expecting a child. She wanted to take time off when that baby was little. So she's going to shut down her practice. And she said, should I cancel my insurance? I said, please don't. Please do not. I don't care if you're not practicing. Just because you're not practicing doesn't mean a client that you saw last year can't make a claim against you. And if you cancel your coverage, you're not going to have coverage for that something that happened before. Keep your coverage. Talk to your insurance people. Talk to NASWRRG. They've got people who are happy to handle these questions. And if they can't answer the question, they are also happy to say, I don't know, but let me find out and we'll get you the answer. Insurance is a good thing to have. And we, we have an extra question and it sort of kind of goes along the lines with, uh, with uh, what we've been talking about. Um, I am gonna add something to it. Um, so as an MSW intern, do I need insurance? And this is my little add on. Um, if so, perhaps what policies? Um, and then I'm, in addition to that question, um, I intern at a group home and do walking therapy with the youth. Um, they're more comfortable walk, talking on walks. Um, I, I would say, yes, you need insurance. Um, I have seen a lot of uh, board complaints. I have seen uh, subpoenas or deposition requests or anything for people who are working in an intern or supervisory, being supervised position. And you wanna have that coverage. You wanna make sure that somebody is, somebody's got your back. Um, I, I wouldn't depend that the person who is supervising you has coverage that covers you. You wanna make sure you're taken care of. Yeah, um, that's where uh, that's where a GL policy would help too. Uh, I mean, suppose, the client stepped in a pothole or something doesn't matter if it's bad weather or not yeah i mean uh i uh i was down in new orleans one time on vacation my son and i this is like noon and we were walking down the street and i had one of those pecan rolls with sugar oh i loved it i was eating that i was more interested in my pecan roll than i was the uh sidewalk and there happened right in the middle of the sidewalk there was a a hole a cave it caved in there's a lot of water in new orleans he caved in it was like a foot deep and you know I, I walked right in it there was no water in it I turned my ankle but I, I realized that something was wrong and I jumped out of it quick enough I didn't get any injury but that could really hurt somebody so you know if you're providing the walk and talk therapy and you happen to be in New Orleans on that same sidewalk that that client's going to get hurt and then you're going to be liable well and and um for for the person who uh, you're volunteering at the group home it does not surprise me that the kids would rather walk and talk. Oh, sure. They don't want to be sharing. They don't want to, anybody else to know that they're talking to somebody because, you know, that, that may not be the cool thing to do. And they, you know, they just, they don't want to share everything yet. And they want it to be more private. But, you know, are they paying attention? Yeah, maybe they got their head down, but do they need to be looking up to see what's on the sidewalk or the path ahead of them are you walking through the woods you know what what's going to happen that way are you know branches falling whatever yeah uh, it's good to have the coverage <laughs> did we cover it all Lonnie? did we hit everything i think yeah i, I yeah i think that's that's a good, good thing are there any other um topics or questions swarming um i have to say um in in my observation from an underwriting standpoint, um, I have to say that um, social workers are the world's best risk managers. Um, assessing you know, what could happen and doing that all in advance 
Um, we are very fortunate as an insurance carrier, but also as a program that supports social workers to have that um, area of expertise. It's something that um, is, it's just, um, I, I'm thankful every time, a lot of times, you know, I'll think of something and um, the uh, professional that I'm working with is five steps ahead of me and I'm like, wow. Yeah, so um, the nice thing is, is that, you know, keep asking those questions um, and keep advocating for um, answers that you're not sure of. And um, so um, I'm, I'm excited just for the opportunity uh, to work with the folks that we do. I, yeah, I would have to agree with Lonnie on that. Um, I get a lot of questions on, on the, the risk management hotline. Um, this has come up, what do I do? I think I wanna expand my practice this way. Um, I'm thinking about adding this service, what do you think? Um, at social workers as a whole do a phenomenal job of asking what if before it happens. Um, and so I applaud you all and encourage you to keep it up. Um, and, and if you're, if you're uh, an NASW RRG insured, not that I'm trying to add to my call sheet, but I'd love to talk to anybody who's got questions like this. That's a, that's a benefit that the RRG policy has that, and I think Phil could probably confirm this for me. I don't know that any other carrier has that feature available where you can call in and ask a what if question. No, or, I don't think so. Now there are, yeah. uh, it's a phenomenal. We're, we're the only carrier that's um, not publicly owned, and uh, we have the uh, uh, lowest cost in the industry. And uh, because of that, we we are able to keep the previews very low and the benefits very high in the policies, and provide service outside the policy, which is a helpline, as an example. Yeah, so um, Helen, did um, did you have any questions? Uh, no, nothing's come through privately this time. Um, and I think we're pretty quiet on Facebook too. So um, please raise your virtual hand if you have questions. Uh, Dina, Lonnie and Phil, um, any last words? Um. No, I, I pretty much shared how excited I am of, of, of what I do. Um, I love it. I love working with, uh, with the folks and. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would agree with Lonnie. I, I love speaking with the social workers and I think I learn as much if not more from you guys when I talk to you as, as you might learn from me. Um, it's, I, I love hearing the stories and I promise uh, the, the details. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't recall the specifics, I recall the general ones. Um, I do have a list in my head of the best questions I've ever been asked and no, I'm not gonna share it here because I promised I wouldn't. But um, I, I learned something new from social workers every day. And so I appreciate being able to share your practice with you and, and continue to work with you like this. So. Beautiful. Lonnie, do you want to put the contact details in the chat box? Um, I think we shared them last week, but somebody's asking. Oh, they. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, that, that question I just popped in there. So um, there's also another email that I added to last week um, include, um, so the catch all, um, if I don't catch it, we also have other resources. We also have another email address called ASI at naswasi.org is an additional um, uh, contact resource. Um, and, um, but um, spot on, um, the E, or excuse me, the website address is naswassurance.org. Um, and that um, actually has a lot of our risk management information, has a lot of helpful tools. 
Um, Phil has also authored over 100 um, topics, risk management topics. Um, so those resources are cataloged and the table of contents is out there. So there's a lot of um, options out there. So NASWAssurance.org has um, that. I'd like to say one thing. I'd like to say one thing in conclusion is um, Ben Franklin said, a penny saved is a, is a penny earned. Well, put that in insurance, shift your risk whenever possible to the third, to the carrier, even third party risk, Sh shift that risk. So yeah, that's gonna cost you some money in premium, but what you spend in money today will eventually save you thousands of dollars in the future because eventually you're gonna get named as the defendant. It, it's just a matter of time. Every practitioner is sued. It's just, it's just gonna, it may take 30 years, but you'll get, you'll get sued or you'll be party to a lawsuit. So, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned, shift your risk when possible. And um, think about the future when you buy your insurance policies. Yeah, just to tag in behind Phil, um, I talked to a lot of social workers who tell me that they have clients or the parents of minor clients or whatever, they have them sign a document when they first start treating saying, I promise I'll never drag you into court. And I, I, I smile and I say, you might as well blow your nose on that piece of paper because that's about what it's worth. Yeah. If somebody wants you in court, they will get you there. Oh, the way that you know how to get you there, Dina, they say the, uh, well, that contract's uh, void because there was not counsel on the other contracting party. They didn't know what they were signing. You have to have, you have to have legal counsel on both sides of the party. So right there, you're right. It's, it becomes uh, tissue paper. Oh, and, it, and at that point, you may need to have an attorney. Attorneys charge $250 an hour up to, I've talked to an attorney who charges $465 an hour. And well, Dina, we're paying $850 an hour for some of our RRG attorney work. So yeah. Yeah, it, this is not cheap. And, and so if you do the math really quickly, the hours add up. Because oh, yeah. I've, worked for, I've worked for attorneys, as I said, for 30 years. They, they bill for everything. So you'll be in the hole quick. Yeah. Uh, shift the risk. And spend $150, $200 now. Save $12,000. Easy math. On uh, a lot of tort matters, uh, an attorney these days, they won't even take your case unless you give them a check for $10,000 up front. You know, I, 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 I've been experienced with that already. Yeah, Dave, we have, I have social workers who have, have reached out to an attorney before they reach out to NASW risk retention group. And they had to pay the attorney $1,500 up front to even get in the door and start whatever they need, even if it's defending them. That's cheap. That's cheap. That's very cheap. Yeah, I mean, my son's an attorney. He's licensed in five states, and uh, he's not that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful what I say to him. Yeah. So, yeah, do yourself a favor. Shift the risk, as Phil said. Shop at that, at that cafeteria line. I'm going to remember that, Phil. I'm going to remember that now. <laughs> I'm going to think of doing this as a cafeteria line, shugging your little chart car, or your tray down the road. Very good, very good. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll see you uh, November 16th for our fourth and final conversation, um, Divorce Mediation and Social Workers, I believe is the title. Thank you everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you November 16th. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye, take care. Bye-bye.